Welcome to the Gentleman's Guide to Gaming. You are an Aquanaut. That's right, an Aquanaut in the service of the Wayland yutani Corporation, one of the largest megacorps the galaxy has ever known. Now, Aquanauts in this universe are not gun-toting maniacs designated to kill all that cross their path. No, they are microbiologists specialising in underwater, so aquatic, alien life forms. Specifically, you and your very select crew, very small because it is a very specialised field, visit planets in the outer reaches of the galaxies with bodies of water, frozen or otherwise, and locate, identify, analyse alien life forms. Now, you've never found an alien life form that's been larger than your petri dish, and you've found very few that are alive, most of them are prehistoric, but it is a field that you love. You get thrilled by the idea of it, you are excited by every drop that you've ever made because you know that you are very nearly a pioneer. I say very nearly. Because you have never been tasked with exploring a world for the first time. They've always been located by Wayland yutani scouts before you have been allowed to set down. So, in that regard, you always feel a bit cheated. While you are certainly the first often to plunge into alien waters and find what you can find, you very rarely find yourself as one of the first to lay his feet down on a planet's surface for the first time. Now, perhaps, is your first opportunity as you are woken from cryosleep, you and your small crew of microbiologists, your aquanauts, a planetoid in the Tartarus system that you are just passing is sending out a distress call. It's not a distress call on a, well, in a language that you can recognise, that your ship can identify, and this planetoid is marked as highly toxic, and yet through scans, done by your navigator, you are able to find that this planet is in fact, well, practically inhabitable. The uh, atmosphere is good, the oxygen levels are decent, it doesn't appear toxic or hazardous at all. In fact, there are bodies of water there, and they are live bodies of water. They are, well, this planet could be another version of Earth. It's rich, it's fertile, it looks healthy. Who could this distress signal be from, and could you be the first ones to touch down on this planet? You cannot say no to this. For one thing, it's Wayland Utani policy to respond to any distress call, but for another, well, the chance to be a pioneer, the first man to set his feet down on a new planetoid. You and your crew touch down on the planet, and you insist on being the first through the doors. You realise that you can breathe the atmosphere before even, well, your systems tell you so. It is a beautiful, verdant, lush land, and you can see the craft in the distance that is sending out the distress signal. Next to you, however, is a body of water, and your initial instinct is you must rush to it and find out what lives in this haven. You send some of your more well-armed crew uh, with their harpoon guns and thermal tasers off to explore the crashed craft, and you start sampling the water. You lose yourself in your reverie, your excitement. You are the first, as I say, and it's only when you start receiving further distress calls on your personal comms from your crew that you're snapped back to reality. You must have been hours. You set up a mini lab on the side of this lake, just looking these magnificent samples from this iridescent purple water feature. The distress calls from your crew are alarming, to say the least. They are apparently being hunted, they are being consumed. There are very few of them left. How did you not hear this before? You realise very shortly as communications switch off entirely. You may be the last of your crew left and all you are armed with is a dart gun, Again, your thermal taser and a small microbiology kit on a world that is perhaps inhabited by aliens. Aliens! Aliens! Ha ha ha! I decided to put the little intro scenario in a different kind of vein to what is expected in the Aliens role-playing game by Leading Edge Games in 1991 release because, well, this game is supposed to be for Colonial Marines. 
I'll be honest, the game is completely manufactured so that you're playing Colonial Marines. And now I know what you're thinking. Colonial Marines, all they can do is go around shooting stuff. But as this game portrays, you can actually use Colonial Marines to not only shoot stuff, but also engage in espion uh, espionage missions, um, well, peacekeeping forays. You could be used to bodyguard a well, high-up exec from other megacorps. Protect the rear guard of a planet being invaded. You could be doing any of anything and well that gives the game a bit of diversity but the rules themselves presented in this game are specifically pertaining to the playing of colonial marines let us not forget that Aliens the Adventure Game, as it styles itself, is almost a cross between a war game and a role-playing game. It often references hex, maps, grids, measuring distances between uh, units and so on, although it doesn't actually give you the miniatures, maps, or anything like that to play with. And that would be one of my first faults, just on the face of this game. It is based heavily on the Phoenix Command system. If you're familiar with Phoenix Command and All Living Steel, you'll know that that is quite an intensive system, to say the least. Um, tables, tables and more tables, mathematical equations, and uh, basing successes on a huge number of modifiers and mitigating factors. We'll go into that in more detail as we go further into the review. It's a game that rolls um, percentile and 3d6 in order to gauge successes. The character creation rules, which is where we'll start this review properly, I know, we're six minutes in, we've not started properly, is where this game starts to find its feet. So, character creation. You can either do it, it gives you the option of completely random rolling or point by, which is I think 4d6 plus um, a base stat of 48. Hudson's character sheet, as presented in the beginning of the uh, book, Hudson being one of the Colonial Marines from the movie Aliens, he has 12 in willpower, which I think is pretty good for him. And your stats, your attributes, uh, or characteristics as they're known, range from the lowest number of 3 up to the highest of 18, so, so much so D&D. However, the uh, system itself works differently to D&D, of course. Uh, character creation actually starts getting interesting when you have to start rolling to see uh, what your character's education was, what his uh, background was in terms of wealth and money, whether he, his social background is underprivileged all the way through to elite. Um, the branch of service that he belongs to, so whether he's in garrison infantry, light infantry, auxiliary um, officer, or maybe staff officer, and then you can start rolling to find out what your specialist training is, what your rank is, and how many tours of duty you've done. Don't worry, this isn't Traveller, so you can't be killed after doing a few tours of duty. But it does have an effect on your character sheets, of course. So, you can play and you can create characters of other backgrounds, but most of the interesting stuff in character generation for this game is angled towards Colonial Marines, which you may well expect. Um, it goes into a great deal of detail on combat load, how much you can carry, how much anyone can carry, the kinds of equipment you may need in character generation. Again, war game. You are thinking exactly, I need one bedroll, two canteens, three electronic lockpicks, one entrenching tool, one first aid kit, one frame pack, one mess kit, one motion tracker, one radio, one set of 20 day rations, one portable welder, and an orbital communications array. Let's not get onto the guns yet. That is the basic Colonial Marine loadout. Just ask Hudson. Or Apo. That's right, there's no art in this game, just photos from the movie Aliens. Now, optional rules. Optional rules um, encompass rank and medals. Medals that will bestow upon you various abilities. So a service ribbon, um, group award, service cross, medal of valour. These will actually give you merit points to use in social situations. I think that's quite a good touch, actually being able to roll up various awards that your character may have got prior to the first adventure. Of course, if you're green marines, then that wouldn't be uh, such, as, uh, such an important thing. The active duties detailed in character generation are also interesting because they open up the game to the different kinds of scenarios you could be playing. You could be on a garrison, a base guard, military police, you could be a security team, a tactical team, a hot patrol, you could be a peacekeeping team, you could be a colonial revolt suppression team, a uh, colonial rescue team, corporate revolt team, renegade military team, Horace Heresy style. It goes on and on and on. That character generation, you and your fellows, the players and the GM, should determine what kind of colonial marine team you are, if indeed you decide to go down that route. 
Skills um, range from untrained through to Grand Master level, which I've always found sounds alarmingly KKK. Now if we take out this bookmark, which is a uh, photo of the APC rushing in to save our colonial marines in the reactor room too little too late, here's how the difficulty in the game works. The action reaction system is a powerful tool for finding a character's st chance of succeeding at any feat. It covers the full range of human activity from scaling a cliff to repairing a weapon to writing a poem. To find out if the character successfully performs a task, total a roll of three six-sided dice. If this sum is less than or equal to the task's success roll, the character has accomplished the task. If the sum is greater than the success roll, he or she fails. That's nice and simple. Basically, the um, number you're aiming for ranges from very easy, base odds of 16, uh, through to average, base odds of 10, through to extremely difficult base odds of 6. And you can have various modifiers. So, for instance, if someone is trying to walk across a 6-inch wide beam, they will be, um, let's say, that a character with a novice rating in balance would have a difficulty of 13. Easy. Uh, minus form because they're on a novice skill, so the difficulty is now 9. So they need to roll a 9 or less. Now let's say that it's windy and uh, we add a plus 2. So they. No. <laughs> um, we need to make the difficulty even harder, so we keep reducing it and, uh, and so on. It's, it's not rocket science, it's not difficult to work out how to work out difficulty in this game. And as far as that's concerned, it sounds very, very simple. If you exceed the difficulty by plus 10, it's a complete disaster, you ruin an entire colony. Um, exceed by minus 10, it's a work of genius, you've just uh, painted the Sistine Chapel, pretty much, with alien acid blood. Um, the skills that fall into brackets, so you have, uh, let's see, uh, gun skills, you have support skills, repair skills, operation skills. It's a, a system I use, a very similar one to what I used for They Came From Beneath the Sea, in fact. And that goes through to unusual skills that people may not otherwise n uh, need, like machine gun operation, uh, comms operations. It's rather specific. And this game is very heavy on skills, because it expects one of your marines to be a support type, one of your marines to be a repair type, one of your marines to be a comms type, etc. It's a war game. It's a cross between a war game and a role playing game, hence why it's an adventure game, I'm guessing. Where this game actually shines is in the setting, because we all know what happens in the Aliens movie, but the expanded universe is something of a mystery, I suppose, beyond what's presented in the movies and, to some degree, the comic books. And while this game could never be considered canonical, especially with Prometheus out and contradicting a lot of what's in here, along with Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection contradicting a lot of what's in here, to be frank, because this was released in 1991, which was prior to the sequels, it goes to some way to describing the um, advancement of human uh, exploration of the galaxy, how we managed to do it, um, how mega corporations expanded to be more powerful than nations, how most colonies are beholden to those corporations rather than nations back on Earth. I think there's one example of a colony that isn't. Uh, how, let's see. Col um, Wayland Utani, for instance, is a corporation that is purely based. Um, despite all evidence to the contrary, on acquiring an alien organism. Well, fancy that. They have mining crews working for them, they have survey crews, they have all manner of crews, however, they are operating under false pretenses. Every uh, ore, every resource that Wayne and Yutani could possibly need is in the immediate solar system. They send people out there under other pretenses in order to find bioweapons and basically trigger traps. I wouldn't say it's a terribly cost-effective way of doing that, but hell, it's a role-playing game, so logic can sometimes go out of the window there. Um, what I think is quite good in the setting chapter, chapter 3, is it does give various options for different types of games. So yes, you can go involve yourself in espionage, corporate warfare, peacekeeping, uh, colonial wars, that kind of thing. You don't have to always be going around shooting aliens, but... The place where I've marked with the um, pull-out of Bishop at playing the knife game with Hudson and Drake, um, we have a map of the universe. It looks like a tube map. It's obviously 2D. 
and this doesn't detail any of the planets that you find, of course, or in Alien 3, well, so Fury, or, um, or whatever the hell it was in Alien Resurrection, might have even been Earth, like God, I hope not. Um, but it does go into the different sectors. It's a bit like Mass Effect, in, in a sense, the way this map is detailed. And in fact, every single planetoid within each sector is detailed with between one through to about six paragraphs worth of text, depending on how interesting it is. Again, this is where the game really shines. Other role-playing games do this as well. Um, everything from 40k through to Eclipse Phase through to uh, Cold and Dark. But this game does it with a fair amount of reverence towards, and reference, towards the Alien and Aliens franchise covering major worlds, tiny colonies, and uninhabited gas giants, that kind of thing. Um, there's a good number of planets here, so you can just read a couple of paragraphs and pick up a story hook, whether it's that the colonists are about to revolt against the corporation that owns them, or maybe there is a gas cloud that's been that's erupted suddenly from, uh, from the surface of a planet that seemed safe and seems to be driving the colonists to a fit of insane peak, or maybe there are aliens that are burrowing from the ground, or perhaps um, face-hugging and chest-bursting, etc. Now, for instance, I'll read some of the uh, planet descriptions where I have marked with a nice picture of Pharaoh being grabbed from behind by his animal. Oh, I'll grab Pharaoh from behind. Uh, for instance, the planet of Cryosphere. A research station has been established on this planet, which is in a very distant orbit around the system's sun. It is a small station with only eight people, and most craft simply pass through the system without going anywhere near Cryosphere. While valuable work is being done regarding the formation of solar systems and planets, the eight scientists at the station are extremely eager to talk with anyone who comes to the planet. So, you know, that's a nice basic one. We also have Stratus was used as a garrison system by Hyperdyne before ICC was created, and there are the remains of a large ground military base and a deep space tracking station here. Today there is only a way station and a small poor salvage operation recovering equipment left over from earlier conflicts. So again, these these planets sound pretty much like the sorts of thing you find in Mass Effect. This goes all the way through to Tartarus, where in this game they start introducing new um, new alien life forms. These aren't just based on xenomorphs, there are Borrowing aliens, there are Arcturans, who I believe are referenced by uh, Frost and Hudson in Aliens. However, given how they're described as ape-like simpletons in this, um, that's the Arcturans, not Frost and Hudson. It makes you wonder why they were talking about Arcturan pussy. Tartarus has graboids from Tremors living on it, essentially. And, or in it. I know, it's a huge armadillo, in fact, although I prefer graboids. I don't think armadillos are that frightening. Although massive ones, it probably would be. There's a, a large chapter, chapter 4, on the life cycle of the aliens, the different types of xenomorph that you find, their metabolism, uh, their acid blood, you know, um, how to remove a face hugger. ha ha ha. It's uh, considered a very difficult task because, you know, it's impossible. Uh, it uh, constricts the throat if you try and pry it off, and if you cut it off, it will just burn straight through the poor old victim. Equipment is a chapter that is chock full of information, as you'd expect in a game that is a cross between a war game and a role playing game. It covers all of the possible firearms, all of the possible vehicles, and spacecraft, and aircraft, and space technology, and frigates, and warships, space facilities, major installations that you would find in the game of Aliens. I'm not going to go into them in too terrible amount of detail because this game does. Combat system. Now combat system is where this well game begins to lose me I suppose because it does expect you to be using a map with hex grids, miniatures and um, the combats are phased in minute detail, two second phases. Uh, it is a game that is predicated heavily on holding your position, aiming and firing. Not a lot of uh, drama, not a lot of um, description. This game is all about you roll to hit, where do you hit, this is how much damage you do. Certainly, certainly a GM could change that if they so chose. But this chapter is a good, well, 30, 40 pages long, and is all about, and then ekes into vehicle combat, which is even more dense, 
And just to describe, I'm going to describe, um, let's go for melee combat, hand to hand, because I think that's a fair one to just describe. Um, let's see. So, each phase the characters involved in hand to hand combat decide what they are going to do with their combat actions using the action costs from the table. Each character then rolls for the strikes and blocks as described above. Um, that is to say, well I'll get on to that. Let's see if he or she hits. If a block is successful, then any one strike of the blocking character has been parried. The character must decide which strike to block before the opponent checks to see if he or she hits. When resolving combat, the highest skill opponent takes the first blow, and the defender can decide whether he will block or not before the success roll is made. Once the results of this blow are resolved, the opponent takes a blow. This exchange of blows continues until all blows have been resolved. So, lots of dice rolling at the start, then you start to just, I suppose, deduct the attacks that you don't favour. When a strike hits, roll randomly to find the um, let's see impact damage done. A set punch does from two to four impact damage. Next, check the hand-to-hand -hand damage table. Remember that there's a table. And go to the portion of the table labelled blunt attacks. Roll a percentile to find the hit location. Choose the appropriate armor line at the top based on the glancing roll modifier for the target's armor and the location that's been hit. Read across the armor line to the highest value that is lower than or equal to the impact damage done. And then cross-index this with the hit location to determine the physical damage. Am I losing you yet? Here's an example. Hudson hits an opponent with a normal punch. The impact dam damage will be 1 to 2. He rolls a 2 and then checks for the hit location. A 44 is rolled, meaning it's hit the lower chest. His opponent is not wearing armour, so the glancing roll modifier is plus 12 and the bottom armour line is used. Reading across the column for 2 impact damage, Hudson cross-indexes and discovers he's done 2 physical damage. If he were wearing a vacuum suit, however, it would have given a plus 6 glancing roll modifier and he wouldn't be able to um, hit the guy. Did that sound heavy going? Yes, it is. There's a hell of a lot to consider in this game if you want to run the rules as is. And by way of illustration, I will show you exactly why. If you love tables, you'll love this game. Everything is tabled out in exacting detail. There are tables for everything. Combat actions, vehicle actions, skill actions, different weapons, um, different weapons used in different scenarios, um, the different um, equipment that you could find on ships. Uh, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Odds of hitting table, uh, you have a hit location table, You uh, depending on different types of weaponry, again. Um, alien hit location tables, harvester, those are the um, graboids. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand damage table, medical aid recovery table, incapacitation time table, weapon accuracy table, vehicle odds of hitting table. Uh, Air-to-ground combat table, aliens movie characters table, ooh, look at that. You've got everyone from Spunkmire to Wisbowski. Um, Pre-generated colonial marines table and alien life forms table. Through from uh, xenomorphs through to Arcturians, morphos and Bracus slugs. And then you have the various weapons that appear in the film. Along with sniper rifles. Hit locations, again, depending on the different spaceship that you're using. Gunships, recon ships, colonial marine frigates, corporate frigates. Uh, the more you say frigate, the more ridiculous it sounds. And an alien character sheet. So, that's this book. It has a basic amount of setting, as I described. That's the highlight here. The rules, too dense for me. I would have to say that this isn't a game that I would usually use to run Aliens unless I really wanted to give it that combat heavy feel. I think there's a lot more that can do be done with the Aliens universe rather than playing Colonial Marines, but imagine the player's excitement. Everyone loves the Aliens film, let's be honest. Who doesn't? If you don't, you're a moron. And as soon as a GM says you're playing Colonial Marines, People are going to start enjoying themselves. People have already got their favourite marine from the film picked out, whether it's Apone, Drake, Hudson, Hicks, whatever. And for that reason, Aliens is a big sell, because, you know, although this was long out of print and costs an exorbitant amount if you can find it, there's a real feel of nostalgia to this role-playing game. And that's probably its strongest point, I would say. It feels like Aliens in a way, it expands the universe in a good way, but it gets bogged down in the combat in a way that could have been done far simpler. If you love your combat to be clunky, mechanical, 
based entirely on dice rolls and not on drama, then fair enough, I think Aliens is spot on. And if you love tables that account for every given possibility under the sun, or the multiple suns across the galaxy, then go for it, do it. Do find this game, because anything by Leading Edge, Phoenix Command, Living Steel, runs in a very similar way. But, would I recommend this on a whim? No. There are other games that run sci-fi and sci-fi war a hell of a lot better than the Aliens Ro Adventure game, let me point out. Not the Aliens role-playing game, the Aliens Adventure game. So, I hope this has been interesting, and it's a game I will certainly run again, but next time I run it I will probably cut out the majority of the rules. Thank you very much for watching.